Hello, everyone. Welcome to uh, the LCRC. We have our webinar today targeting homelessness prevention in the midst of COVID-19. Uh, it is part of our homeless housing opportunities expansion and homeless prevention learning community group. So we're so excited for you all to be here. We're excited for the conversation today. But first, we will start with the promise of community action. Community action changes people's lives, embodies the spirit of hope, improves communities, and makes America a better place to live. We care about the entire community, and we are dedicated to helping people help themselves and each other. This is the Practice Transformation Team uh, that's responsible for um, bringing some of this content to you today. Uh, the area, we are led by our Senior Vice President for Practice Transformation, Tiffany Marley, our Director for Practice Transformation, Lily Seals, our Director for Whole Family Approach Innovations, our Program Associate for the LCRC, Amy Roberge, and myself, Gabriel Smith. So uh, our agenda for today is pretty short and sweet. We have our welcome, uh, which we're getting through right now. Uh, we have introductions, and then we have our presentation from our uh, amazing panel today, and then we will close out for the day. So, uh, we have with us Greg Barchuk, who is um, Lead for Homeless Services Specialist at ICF, and Marcy Thompson, Senior Director for Homeless Service at ICF as well. So I will turn it over to you all. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you so much. And uh, I think we'll just give it a moment as uh, our presentation comes up and then we'll get, right, uh, get started. All right, thanks again. Um, and welcome to today's session on targeting uh, prevention resources. You know, we know this is a really busy time in everyone's life. We are both responding to a pandemic as well as living through one. Um, and so we, you know, really appreciate, you know, you giving your attention to what we think is a really important way to think about homelessness uh, and how to address housing instability in our communities. We have a couple of uh, webinar objectives to go over today. Um, we'd like to understand the elements of a homelessness prevention strategy um, and discuss some approaches to targeting prevention efforts for maximum effectiveness and efficiency. Um, and then we'd also like to close out by giving some examples about how prevention has been implemented locally and uh, at the community level, and particularly how to figure out you know, how to get started um, if you are you know, looking at for ways to target your prevention resources. Next slide, please. So this notion of targeting prevention resources is not something that's new. It existed prior to COVID-19, but I think the, the pandemic has really underscored how we're living in a new world. And it's one that demands that we operate differently than we did in the past. Uh, you know, the CARES Act introduced an unprecedented level of federal investment in disease mitigation efforts in our homeless programs um, with the, uh, the goal of helping to stem the tide of housing and security, easing the burden on an already overstressed and strained system. Um, and yet, we continue to see disproportionate impact of COVID-19 on people who are Black, Brown, Latin, or Latinx, uh, and Indigenous, as well as those who are elderly um, or who have health problems. Um, and this isn't just from the standpoint of infection and mortality, uh, but also the economic impacts, right, of job loss and, uh, and housing instability. Um, and so even prior to the pandemic, the forces that push people into homelessness are applied much harder on people of color and in different ways. Uh, so if we wanna push back and work towards not just ending homeless crises, but also preventing them, um, we have to acknowledge that these larger systemic issues are at play uh, and they are not pushing on all communities in the same way or with the same severity. Um, we need to acknowledge the reality that historically pursuing strategies that attempt to serve everyone the same as if these differences in experience don't exist really have rarely worked. Um, and so if we're serious about um, working differently, that means thinking strategically about who we partner with, uh, setting clear performance goals uh, that address racial disparities and underserved populations, and then targeting interventions where they're desperately needed and in ways that right these wrongs. Uh, and so today we'd like to talk through the details of how to think about doing that uh, and Marcy Thompson is going to kick us off on the focus of today's session, targeting prevention and effective strategies to start thinking through how we might begin doing that. Marcy? All right. Um, thanks, Craig. So, you know, these are certainly some unprecedented times, uh, 
But we do, as we think about uh, targeting homelessness prevention, we do have learning, uh, as uh, you've mentioned, from our pre-COVID days that can help inform how we uh, target prevention going forward. Um, before we really get started, I think it's important to note that um, eviction prevention does not fall within what is typically considered targeted homelessness prevention. Uh, this is a really hot topic, especially with the eviction moratorium being lifted, uh, and it's important to acknowledge that. Uh, and there are resources available for eviction prevention, such as the Emergency Rental Assistance Program out of the Department of Treasury. Uh, and also, you know, communities really can work with both traditional and non-traditional community partners to leverage other resources. Next slide, please. Um, so today when we're talking about uh, 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 homelessness prevention, we're going to be using terms uh, effective and efficient, and we're going to be using these terms throughout the presentation. So it's really important that we make sure that we're on the same page and clear about what we mean when we use these terms. Uh, prevention programs reduce homelessness when they are both effective and efficient. When we say effective, when we're talking about uh, homelessness prevention, we're really talking specifically about interventions that help people find and maintain stable housing in order to avoid homelessness. But when we're talking about efficient, what we're really saying is that these inter interventions are targeted to assist people that would be homeless, but for this assistance. Um, so today we're really going to be focusing on what it means for programs to be both effective and efficient. Next slide. The gray circle here uh, uh, represents the population of people who are at risk of becoming homeless. Uh, we know from data that most people at risk of homelessness, uh, including folks that, uh, that are at risk of eviction or even those who become evicted, um, will never actually become homeless. The yellow circle represents the people who will become homeless, who we know are gonna um, enter homelessness. The blue circle represents the people uh, a particular program serves with prevention assistance. In the first diagram, we see an example of a program where targeting of prevention dollars was 100% inefficient in that none of the people who received assistance would have actually become homeless. As a result, the program had no impact on homelessness within the community overall. And the same number of people became homeless, um, ended up becoming homeless as if that prevention program didn't actually exist. Uh, so universal prevention is first come first served approaches with very large target populations. Um, and these again, have very little impact on the number of people that are experiencing homelessness. The second diagram shows a community that better targeted their assistance. They targeted their prevention assistance to people who would have become homeless without their prevention um, assistance. And thus they were able to reduce the number of people who became homeless as a result, which does reduce inflow and has an impact on the overall homelessness response uh, system. So we're gonna spend a little bit of time talking about how to identify that yellow circle group people who are most likely to become homeless so that you can efficiently target them. Before we go there, let's remind ourselves of why we want to be efficient and effective uh, in, uh, in our targeting. Obviously, we need to be good stewards of resources and actually reach the intended population of people that we wanna serve. Um, when we have seen poorly designed prevention interventions, the result can include applications for assistance that will overwhelm your system, uh, people will, will have wasted time, um, you know, applying for assistance and then not uh, really being eligible. Uh, people will lose trust uh, if they feel like they're not able to get, uh, if they feel like there's mixed messages. People will, uh, with better access to computers or who have, are better at navigating social services or who have more free time. So for example, people that don't have children are more likely to be able to get assistance. Um, people with disabilities, for example, will not be. Um, systems will lose credibility. 
Um, and we won't actually know that the investment reached the intended group of people and reduced inflow into homelessness. So for all of these reasons, again, it's really critical that we strive for programs that are both efficient and effective. Next slide, please. All right, so we're gonna be talking about both primary prevention and secondary prevention. Primary prevention strategies are those that attempt to mitigate the direct factors that lead to homelessness. Secondary prevention uh, refers to strategies that help people find safe alternatives when individuals are seeking shelter or are likely to have, have to stay in an unsheltered location. So this is often referred to as diversion. Um, so somebody is literally at the front door of the homeless response system, but we're able to uh, prevent uh, the need for that shelter stay or um, stay in an unsheltered location uh, uh, through diversion. All right, next slide, please. So let's dig into these a little bit more. Um, primary prevention strategies uh, aim to reduce uh, individual and structural risk factors that contribute to homelessness and increase protective factors that shield against homelessness. Next slide. There are a few types of primary prevention strategies and here you'll see some of uh, some definitions. We're not going to spend a ton of time today really talking about universal strategies, but just so we're clear, these would be strategies that provide protection to a broad array of people who might be at risk of homelessness. Uh, might be is really the iterative part there. Um, these include public benefit programs, affordable housing development, and education and employment programs. When we're talking about selected group strategy, we're talking about targeting assistance, housing assistance to those who face significant structural barriers that make the loss of housing more likely. Selected group strategies can include prioritizing resources for households that fall into one of the groups identified by the community's data as being most likely to become homeless, such as those living in neighborhoods where there's a high percentage of residents um, that have previously experienced homelessness, um, individuals with criminal justice histories, households that moved frequently in the past year, households with children younger than two years old, um, and households uh, involved with child protective services. When we're talking about indicated uh, group strategy, we're talking about targeting households that are likely to enter emergency shelter or unsheltered location because of individual uh, circumstances such as partner or domestic violence, um, health, uh, health problems, or lost housing. Now we're gonna walk you through each of these strategies and offer up some examples and successes that communities have seen. Next slide, please. All right. Um, in determining target populations, you must know local data and must engage with the communities that are most impacted. When we're rushing to get money out the door quickly, we often make a, assumptions and make decisions based on those, based on those assumptions. The goal here uh, is to keep marginalized populations housed, targeting assistance to those who likely face significant structural barriers that make loss of housing more likely. If correctly designed, adequately resourced, and informed by people most impacted, these strategies will reduce racial disparities in who experiences homelessness. Um, key partnerships. It should go without saying that people up with lived experience uh, should always be front and center from design to implementation, even to evaluation. Other partnerships might include legal aid and eviction courts, um, advocacy organizations and nonprofits, uh, especially those that are led by people of color and primarily serve, uh, serving the selected target populations. Uh, community action agencies are also always a good uh, key partner to have uh, in this as well. Communities can use a racial equity impact assessment tool to begin this work and continuously use these tools throughout design and implementation. There are tools offered by the Department of Housing and Urban Development, as well as the National Alliance to End Homelessness that can be used to analyze local data for racial disparities. Next slide, please. 
So we're going to uh, feature a community in a little bit um, uh, that Greg is going to talk us through about a great example from Montgomery County, PA. But for now, um, we're going to focus on a, a few other examples. Um, so in New York City, uh, New York City, there's the home base program, which is um, there's been a lot of, of uh, research done about this uh, study, a lot of um, um, messaging around best uh, practices come out uh, have been a result of this study. So in the home-based program, it was a neighborhood-based strategy. Um, it's, uh, they used data to target households most likely to experience homelessness and then used geocoding to identify hotspots of shelter demand. Um, in Columbus, Ohio, uh, there was an effort to advance equity and they implemented a uh, implemented targeted prevention strategies in the Linden neighborhood, um, which was selected for focused prevention effort uh, as a pilot community. They created a targeted assessment um, that awards points based on preferences. The current focus is to target assistance geographically where there are high proportions of African-American residents and poverty. Next slide, please. Um, moving on from selected group strategies, we're going to now talk about indicated group strategies. Uh, here, the goal is to keep people housed, um, uh, keeping people housed who would otherwise uh, most likely have entered emergency shelter or an unsheltered location because of individual circumstances. Uh, this is most efficient at preventing homelessness. So the targeted population is is really being able to um, identify those risk and predictive factors that are most likely to predict who would experience homelessness, but for this assistance. Um, there are some risk and predictive factors that we have seen in data repeatedly um, that support kind of what could be used. Um, but local data also should be used and examined to understand characteristics of the households that are entering shelter locally. Um, and then that, can, and also who, who are becoming unsheltered. Um, again, uh, key partners, people with lived experience uh, should always be seen as key partners, but also health clinics, clinics, schools, community action agencies, religious leaders, criminal justice partners are all key partners that can help approach things in new and creative ways. Next slide, please. All right, I mentioned a moment ago that there are risk and protective factors that are important to pay attention to. It's important to identify both risk and protective factors to be efficient with indicated group strategies. Use this information about common pathways to inform how you might uh, create targeted strategies. Common groups to look out for based on these factors include um, households who have eviction proceedings initiated. Um, so not just at risk of eviction, but the uh, uh, eviction proceedings have already started. Um, families with a young head of household, households in doubled up situations, households who are losing their homes or have an, an eviction threat and recently lost employment in a sector impacted substantially by COVID-19. Um, individuals who are exiting institutions like, uh, like detention centers or jails, prisons or hospitals, and individuals who age out of foster care. The most common pathways into homelessness are exits from an institutional setting or from a double up arrangement. People who have experienced homelessness in the past are also more likely to experience another occasion of homelessness in the future. Uh, one, uh, when we did, a, uh, we did a study, there was a study done a number of years ago um, on what was the most likely factor that would weigh, uh, weigh into whether or not somebody would experience homelessness. And they found uh, that really the, the biggest predictor is that past occurrence of homelessness. Other major risk factors include foster care involvement and criminal justice involvement. Next slide, please. All right, um, so a couple of examples of communities with indicated group strategies. Um, the Washington State Department of Commerce created a targeted prevention screening tool that assesses risk factors and rehousing barriers to prioritize populations at greatest risk of experiencing literal homelessness. 
So these are folks that are um, most likely uh, to end up needing to access shelter or experiencing unsheltered homelessness. Uh, the tool is based on both local and national data. In Omaha, they use risk factors that were informed by the homeless, uh, Homelessness Prevention and Rapid Rehousing Program, or HPRP. This was a Recovery, Health, Recovery Act program, um, as well as the VA's Supportive Services for Veteran Families Program, um, and community-based research to intentionally target private investments during their response to COVID-19. Right, next slide. Now let's talk about secondary prevention strategies. As a reminder, households seeking shelter or who are the most likely to, uh, to need to either stay in shelter tonight or will otherwise be unsheltered is the group that we're really focusing on when we talk about secondary prevention strategies. Uh, commonly referred to as diversion, secondary prevention programs seek to provide a safe alternative for people who are on the brink of homelessness, intervening at that critical time um, and identifying short-term solutions, such as staying with a family member or delaying an, ev an eviction for a couple of weeks while working with the participant on a more permanent solution, can prevent prolonged experiences of homelessness and preserve shelter and targeted homeless resources for those with no other options. Applying problem-solving techniques and secondary prevention creates a huge opportunity to reduce your inflow into the homelessness response system. And it also reduces trauma experienced by people experiencing homelessness. The beauty of housing problem solving techniques uh, that are applied through a diversion strategy or through a secondary prevention strategy is that really any community partner can support and engage in this activity when folks that they work with are experiencing a crisis. Um, so community action agencies, for example, um, are uniquely positioned to partner with homelessness response systems to engage in secondary prevention uh, to serve the folks that, they, that they're engaging with. Next slide, please. A couple of examples that we want to highlight for you today. Um, first, uh, in Missoula, Montana, they created a centralized diversion fund for people at the front doors of their system including shelter drop-in um, shelter drop-in and outreach programs. Uh, this resulted uh, in basically anytime somebody uh, entered one of these locations to seek assistance, they were engaged in problem-solving conversations in order to try and um, divert them um, and divert and avoid uh, an occurrence of homelessness. So uh, really wherever the household went to seek assistance, they were engaged in this, uh, in this type of um, assistance. In Washington, D.C., they had a shelter diversion program um, at one of their really large shelters. So anyone coming to that location is engaged in a problem-solving discussion in order to identify any safe alternatives to emergency shelter, such as staying with family and friends, um, or maybe some light touch assistance in order to help the household avoid a shelter stay. Right, next slide. So while the objectives and targeting um, differ between the types of prevention, the array of services needed may be very similar. Uh, and these might include short or medium term rental assistance, um, assistance with rental arrears, uh, housing identification, relocation, move-in assistance, utility assistance, mediation or legal services, and credit repair. Services provided should be tailored to the needs of each household, and not all households will need all services, though the ability to tap into each of these types of services or support is really critical to meeting the needs of participants. So now I'm gonna turn it back over to my colleague, Greg, to talk about a community example that he's actually really familiar with. Greg? Thanks, Marcy. Uh, and the reason for that is that uh, while I'm also a uh, TA here at ICF, uh, I'm a resident of Montgomery County and I was the former data manager there uh, and HMIS system administrator. Um, so I'm you know, sitting in, in two roles here. Um, I'm gonna be talking a little bit about our eviction prevention work that we did in Montgomery County, but to be clear, this was a program for folks who had eviction proceedings initiated. Um, and really to Marcy's point, that's, 
that's not the goal for today's session. I'm sharing that, or I will be sharing that information. Mostly it's just a means of thinking through the targeting aspect. Um, if we could go to the next slide, please. So I wanted to give a little bit of background and context into the county and sort of how we got to the place of starting to pursue uh, prevention work. Um, Montgomery County is in the southeastern region of Pennsylvania. Uh, it's one of the suburban counties just outside of Philadelphia. It's that small yellow dot on the map here. Um, and it's, it's very suburban for the most part. It's geographically quite large in comparison to some of the other counties in the state. Um, there isn't really any population center that I think would be large enough to qualify as a city. Um, and it's also a fairly wealthy county. I think we're the second or third wealthiest county in the state. So you see lots of new construction going up for large single family homes, uh, large townhomes, lots of open space for horses and sunflower fields. Um, you know, and as a result, it's a very expensive place to live uh, or to own a home, to rent. Um, but there are also pockets of poverty in very specific geographic areas in the county uh, that often overlap with um, communities where a higher percentage of black residents live and other people of color. Um, about six to seven years ago now, uh, the county overhauled its entire homeless response system from one that was very much based on housing readiness uh, with lots of side doors into shelter uh, into one that became very housing first very quickly um, with an extremely coordinated front door. Um, we integrated coordinated entry into HMIS in 2015. We made HMIS the backbone of our coordinated entry system. Um, and if certain, what that means is that if certain tasks didn't get completed in HMIS immediately, the person didn't move further through the system. Uh, and so what we did, to be honest, was really sort of forced buy-in into a new way of thinking uh, and a new way of delivering homeless services um, that we felt was really necessary when we looked at our, our data, particularly our, our shelter data, just prior to this change, we saw that over 40% of people entering shelter were not coming from a literal homeless uh, residence, um, which meant that a lot of people who were literally homeless weren't getting served at all. Um, in order to you know, accommodate those, those side doors and who you know relationships that were mostly among uh, caseworkers, you know, who needed a solution for families and, and individuals in crisis, um, but then we're finding a solution that didn't actually meet those families' needs. Uh, and in doing so, then also didn't help people you know, who did need those interventions. Um, so we saw that there was really you know, an important need for a change. And the overhaul that we implemented worked really well. We saw, as you can see on the slide here, a 47% reduction in our point in time count you know, over the next five years. Um, we were rapidly rehousing about 150 households a year. Um, and so once we felt like we had righted the ship of the crisis response system and implemented strong rehousing strategies, we then wanted to better understand the upstream factors that pushed households into homelessness in the first place. Um, and that led us to embracing racial equity and looking for ways to meet people's needs in much more uh, effectively targeted ways. Can we go to the next slide, please? So... Montgomery County's Your Way Home Initiative um, has really always embraced the value of making decisions informed by data and best practices in order to have a meaningful impact you know, in its homelessness system. Um, and so it made sense for us to turn the lens then upstream. Um, we were fortunate to find a great partner in Barbara Poppy, who we began working with in 2017, uh, to understand our system inflow and how best to implement strategies to prevent homelessness. Um, pit count data, as I mentioned, has always measured the crisis of homelessness in Montgomery County as being fairly small, but qualitatively and through better analysis of HMIS data and through the work with, with Barbara, we knew that housing instability in our county is, is actually much larger. Um, and so her research in Montgomery County, uh, including her scan of best practices um, and our local data analysis led to three recommendations, which you can see on the slide here for targeted homeless prevention strategies. The first is, as I mentioned already, a court-based eviction prevention program called EPIC, um, which was established in 2018. Uh, a school-based eviction prevention, or sorry, a school-based prevention program, which we called Sprout, um, which targeted districts with high rates of student mobility uh, and high McKinney-Vento numbers. Uh, that was implemented beginning in the 2018-19 school year. And then the third strategy was a universal screening tool for targeting prevention. Um, we didn't have time to implement this pre-COVID, but uh, we did launch a targeted emergency uh, rent program with funds that came in as a result of the pandemic. 
For today's discussion though, as I've already mentioned, the, the details of these programs specifically are, are less relevant. Uh, Your Way Home has published uh, a number of different reports on, on the two that are on the, the slide here. Um, and, and I believe the links for them are later in the presentation. Um, for now though, really wanted to talk more about the strategies uh, that we use to launch them, uh, how data fit into that work, and you know how equity now influences everything that Montgomery County uh, is doing when it tries to launch new programs, uh, including the prevention work during uh, done during COVID. Next slide, please. So right at the beginning, um, this is something that we started to look at at least five or six years ago. Um, when we began digging deeper into our system performance data, disaggregating it by race, by ethnicity, by age and gender, uh, household type and geography, it was immediately apparent that people of color are overrepresented by a large degree in the homelessness system here locally, um, particularly residents who are black. Um, this is true almost everywhere in the country. It's especially true in Montgomery County. Um, ours is a community that's predominantly white. You know, as you can see on the graph here, about 80% of our population is white. Um, black residents make up only about 10% of our population um, and also primarily live in certain communities, Norristown and Pottstown, and to a lesser extent in Lansdale as well. Now, understanding that folks listening to this right now are probably not familiar with Montgomery County or are maybe wondering why do I, why am I even mentioning these specific places, that will become apparent in a few moments. Um, I'll return to why you know um, I'll return to, uh, to to talking about them a little bit more in in just a moment. But the first indicator of a problem to us um, was that while Black residents make up only ten percent of our county population, they account for over fifty percent of our homeless population. Next slide, please. And so now the previous slide was something that I think a lot of communities have begun uh, to look at more in depth over the last few years. There's some great tools um, put out on the HUD exchange that you know, help uh, populate graphs like that one. Um, and that's really important to examine, but I would, I would push communities that are looking at this to go even further, if you can, to look at intersection of race with other data as well. So by gender, by, by age or geographic location um, and by household type as well. So when, when we began looking at race and gender, and race and age uh, categories, we found that the single largest group in our system were Black or African American children. Uh, nearly a quarter of all people experiencing homelessness in Montgomery County are Black children, mostly under age 12. Uh, and the second largest group um, are Black residents aged 25 to 34, many of which are likely their parents. So if you look at the graph here, and I know it's a little bit small, that very, very long line at the top that's blue, um, those are are black children. And then the next, you know, the bar that's immediately below them, that's also longer than all of the rest, um, are 25, uh, 25 to 34 year olds who are also black. Um, this was incredibly impactful to me uh, and to the rest of our team. And it led to a better understanding of who's becoming homeless in our county. It's most often black children and their families. Um, and so I think just looking at race or gender or age without looking at the intersection of them, misses some key important um, factors to, to know about your community if you're not looking at them that way. So I really urge uh, folks to try to do that if you can. Um, as we were doing this disaggregation of data, um, we we're also working with Barbara Poppy at the same time to dig into things like our eviction data. Um, we partnered with our uh, local legal aid uh, to look at eviction data by zip code in the county. Um, remember those counties that I mentioned on the previous slide, um, the highest number of evictions in Montgomery County happened in Norristown and then in Pottstown and to a much lesser extent in Lansdale. Um, then we looked at our county school data, uh, specifically at student uh, rates of student mobility. Um, and so student mobility is, is a measure of students moving from school to school for reasons other than grade promotion. And it's often an indicator of housing instability. Uh, we found that the districts with higher rates of student mobility also overlapped with the same communities that I've already mentioned a couple of times now. So these things are clearly not disconnected from each other. Um, you know, as I said a few minutes ago, the factors that lead to homelessness push harder on people of color, uh, particularly on black residents, on women and on families with children. Um, you know, so we found in Montgomery County that evictions and student mobility are more frequent in communities where populations of black residents are the highest. Um, and just to really underscore that point, we found that 
60% of all evictions in Montgomery County happened in just two zip codes, one in Norristown and one in Pottstown. Uh, despite neither of those two communities being the most densely populated areas of our county, they're just the communities where more black and brown people live. Um, and so all of this is what led to us launching more targeted prevention projects in Montgomery County, as opposed to something that was wide, widely available to everyone. You know, and we got pushback from that. You know, there were folks who wanted to have, you know, to see Epic in their community or, you know, wanted to have something like the Sprout Initiative in their community, um, you know, and due to things like limited resources, but also really wanting to focus our efforts where it was going to have the greatest impact, we chose to target our efforts in specific areas. Um, so we targeted our eviction prevention pilot in Norristown um, because we found that over 50% of the households uh, that were you know, going to be using that program were headed by a black woman. Um, and it was interesting to see that their success in the program was among the highest of any race gender group um, that utilized the program despite paying some of the highest rents and earning the lowest incomes of program participants. Um, our school-based program was a little bit of a different experience. Um, here we learned a lot of important things about the work necessary to build strong partnerships with systems that really often don't work together. Um, school systems, homeless systems don't always speak the same language, including you know, around definitional things like what is homelessness. Um, you know, and so that can lead to misunderstandings. Um, we found that it was really important during that project to keep lines of communication open among the different partners, uh, be transparent about our goals, our values, you know, and our resources. Um, and that, you know, keeping lines of dialogue doesn't just extend to system partners, it also extends to the people who are, you know, utilizing the program or who could potentially be utilizing the program. You know, one of the things that we learned, and this may sound silly, but it's often missed, um, is that you know, we actually needed to listen to the people who we were trying to help. Um, again, that sounds like a very simple concept, but I think it's not something that our systems often do. Um, when we launched Sprout, uh, we did it with honestly a very one size fits all approach. Um, you know, we kind of came in thinking that we're going to offer housing location and rental assistance and essentially use a rapid rehousing model, um, you know, but prevention style. Um, and it was, we found that it was actually hard to get people to enroll um, because that's not what everyone who was unstably housed in this community actually wanted uh, or was looking for. And so we needed to slow down. And once we did that and started to engage with people uh, and hear about what needs they were identifying um, and thankfully had the flexibility to adjust on the fly to change the model from what we were originally, what we had originally built you know, to what we needed to build if we wanted to make a meaningful impact, we were able to get the project going again, you know, and start helping more households in a way that was meaningful for them. Um, and last, I'll just mention uh, again that looking at our, you know, our homeless data, um, you know, in combination with other, um, other sources, we learned that our uh, Latin or Latinx population in Montgomery County faces high rates of housing instability, overcrowding, also the impact of COVID-19, uh, none of which was leading that group to access and coordinated entry um, for reasons that I think you know, have more to do with the system itself. Um, but what the county decided to do uh, when it was starting to think about launching an emergency rent program uh, to help renters respond to COVID, uh, they partnered with an organization run by folks who are uh, Latinx or Latin. Uh, uh, the folks who work at that organization speak Spanish um, and have strong and deep uh, roots in the communities within the county. Um, can we go to the next slide, please? So one of the things that, you know, I was really excited, especially as a data person, uh, to see was the impact on our data and specifically on our system inflow. Um, I should say at the beginning, I, and it's, it says here on the slide as well, don't have enough information to link these causally at this point, um, but the timing feels really noteworthy. And so I think it's worth sharing them. Um, the first, after we were doing, began doing this work, was the reduction in our prioritization list. Uh, so after we launched targeted prevention programs, and at the same time we're overhauling our problem solving, uh, uh, housing problem solving approaches, um, we started to see fewer people contact a coordinated entry. Um, fewer people staying in the system seeking a formal housing intervention. Um, so our inflow began to decrease. Um, 
both the launch of these strategies and the pattern in the data are, are pre-COVID, but I think the lesson is that potentially this kind of work can have a meaningful impact on inflow. Um, next, we started to look at the measure, um, we started to measure the impact of prevention um, by looking at the percentage of folks who received these interventions and yet still returned to coordinated entry within 30 days afterward, um, you know, and then we're presenting as literally homeless. So does prevention actually prevent people from coming into coordinated entry or not? Um, and what we found was that around 75 to 85% of the folks uh, who had received these interventions didn't then come back into coordinated entry. Um, so there was a meaningful impact there. Um, and then last, I don't have enough data to directly link these things, but after we started targeting our efforts in, in new ways, we started to see our length of time homeless decrease, um, which was pretty interesting. There's, there's a report in our work called the System Performance Measures Report, and the very first metric on that is length of time homeless. Um, Montgomery County has had a lot of success in overhauling its system, and we were seeing a lot of those successes in our data, but we weren't seeing it in length of time homeless. Despite everything else that we were doing, that metric year after year kept going up. Um, and it was really a, a thorn in the side of our system. Um, it was only after a year of doing prevention work that we suddenly saw a decrease in length of time homeless on our official you know, federal system performance measures report. Um, so again, I don't have enough to, to directly link those, um, but I'm hopeful that that's not a coincidence um, and is related to you know, prevention and housing problem solving you know, as means of easing capacity burdens, um, affording workers in the system more time and energy to devote to, you know, assisting homeless households in gaining permanent housing, because we're not serving, you know, folks, you know, with inappropriate interventions, or as many folks as we were prior to doing this work. Next slide, please. So I wanted to just briefly mention some uh, lessons that we learned uh, through this work, in addition to what I've already talked about. Um, I think first, look at your local data. Um, HMIS can help uh, point to some trends uh, and suggest upstream uh, areas to, to target or, or to investigate, um, but also try to make connections with other systems that work with people before their crises turn into homelessness. Um, talk with people with lived you know, expertise and experience um, about what led to their homelessness and you know, see if there are paths to, to target strategies there that are informed by those experiences. Uh, and if you're going to bring people with lived experience in the work, make sure you appropriately compensate them for their time. Um, you know, we compensate everyone else in our planning act activities after all. Um, uh, next, formalize partnerships uh, with other systems. Make sure you have a plan to build actual strong relationships interpersonally with the, with the key folks doing the work. Um, it's not always a natural fit, uh, and we need to invest the time and the energy in order to do it well. You know, thinking back to the, um, our school-based intervention. Um, when you have folks not speaking the same language, not entirely sure what each other's motivations are, you know, or even again, like agreement on definitional terms, it's really important to, to both formalize those, those uh, relationships, but then also invest in the time to building them and making them strong. Um, plan for snags. Your first time around with something new is not likely to go perfectly. Um, pleased to see that things with, with Epic went really smoothly, you know, knock on wood. Um, but Sprout did not go that way for quite a while. Um, you know, and, and so I think it's important to build in monitor, monitoring activities throughout the process. Don't wait until the end to then see how you did. Um, you want to be able to identify problems early and adjust. If we hadn't been doing that with Sprout, the program would have been a failure. Um, but we had to, to, only because we were monitoring it, and saw that, for example, you know, we were getting low enrollment of folks uh, and then started to investigate what's going on there and, and talking to you know, different people than we were talking to, um, we got new information and were able to adjust. Um, and then you know, also, if you can, if there's a funding structure in place to do this, invest the time to analyze what you did. Um, what we did with Sprout in particular was partnered with a local university and offered stipends to graduate students um, who helped us understand our school-based prevention program better. They were able to develop a tool uh, to use um, in this work and were instrumental in getting the feedback that we needed to hear that um, led us to understand why things weren't going well at the beginning and what we needed to, 
do to adjust. Um, they were just great partners to work with and I think really lend something to, um, to the work overall and our understanding of what we were doing and what we did and you know, what we needed to do differently in the future to make that program even more successful. Um, you know, and, and, and honestly, so I think the, the other piece of that is if you can invest in any kind of analysis work, bring those folks into the process early too. So as I mentioned, you know, they were key in helping us pivot because they were there from the beginning. So as we were building the program, we had uh, our graduate students at the table. They were hearing the things that we were interested in and that helped them not only think through how am I going to evaluate this, but what are the, the things that they know from their own experience you know, that, that they can you know, bring to the table to help us you know, think through and, and plan for it differently. Um, you know, so there's their theoretical uh, understanding and knowledge of, of what's been uh, done in other sectors, you know, that they can, they can, in other parts of the country that they can bring in that's really valuable. Um, and then, of course, they can help you quantify the impact of your efforts for future planning. Next slide, please. So these are a number of uh, different resources that are available to think through a lot of what Marcy and I have talked about today. Um, Many of these are, are links to the HUD exchange. Um, there's lots of, of great information that you can gain about just HUD in general and rapid rehousing, but also specifically around prevention, um, using prevention to promote equity and other things. Um, really great information there. Next slide. And then last, I mentioned that there was more information in case you were interested in more of the programmatic details or the analysis that we did on EPIC as well as Sprout you can go to Montgomery County's website uh, and as well the uh, Montgomery County Bar Association for um, links to some of the different reports that um, are available that uh, we worked on. Next slide, please. All right, well, thank you very much. That's all we have today. Marcy, wanted to give you a moment if you had any final closing comments as well. Um, yep. All right. Well, thank you so much. Hope this information was valuable for you and uh, have a great day. All right, everyone. Um, we are so glad that you were able to join us for this. Um, we really enjoyed this conversation, um, but we will close out. So I'll go through a few of our uh, resources that we have available for you all. Let me share my screen. All right, so um, I'm, hopefully people have been um, hearing about the child tax credit. Uh, we are doing everything that we can to get the word out about that so we can make sure that we're reaching those that are um, at the highest risk and most affected uh, that, and also those that can benefit the most from it. Uh, so please visit www.childtaxcredit.gov to uh, learn more about uh, eligibility and to uh, uh, see ways that you can help others that may be eligible but may not know that they're eligible. Then we have our COVID-19 uh, resource series. Uh, this is research that's been done uh, based on uh, responses to COVID-19 from uh, community action agencies all across the country. Uh, lots of great stuff here. And then uh, we made a video where we have uh, various community action leaders, staff, participants, uh, members talking about reasons why they've gotten vaccinated and why you should get vaccinated as well, if you haven't already. And then we have our Whole Family Approach Institute website, which is loaded with tons of information that uh, you, is free to use. Um, and we, we definitely want you to, to share it and spread it out as much as you can. And then uh, we have Community Action Academy. Uh, that is where most of our resources reside. Um, this slideshow will be there as well at some point. Um, but we, uh, we, we highly encourage people to go check out our Community Action uh, Academy to take advantage of all the great resources that we have there. And this is a resource from our friends at the National Alliance to End Homelessness. There are a few online classes um, self-guided classes that you can participate in. And then we also have promo codes that you can use where it will basically be free for you. Um, so we are coming up on the end of that. The deadline for that is the 30th. So you have a few days left to sign up for that and take advantage of uh, the free promo codes. 
And as always, um, this is our contact information for the Practice Transformation Team. Uh, please feel free to reach out to us with any questions you have, any suggestions about future programming. Uh, we, we, are, we would love to hear from you all. All right, thank you so much, and we will see you all later.